create this new person that we want to be. I'm going to share a model that I think is going to be very helpful in looking at your own life and saying, how can I use this model to create a great life for myself? It's also a model you can use with people you coach. It's a model you can use with teams. Or even at the macro level, it's a model you can use in an organization. In our model, we're going to look at two dimensions. One dimension is called change versus keep. What do we want to get rid of in life and what do we want to keep? The second part of our dimension is called positive, negative. Positive, what's great in life that we, we want to reinforce and negative, what is it we want to get rid of? If we look at our four quadrants, the first quadrant is called creating. Creating, who is the new me that I want to create? How is that person in the future going to be different than that person in the past? What is this positive change that you want to create in yourself? It could be new relationships, it could be new education, it could be learning. Challenge yourself with this question. Who is the new me that I want to create? And describe what that is to you. Our second dimension is called positive keep. This is called preserve. What is it about myself I want to preserve? What is it about myself I want to, I want to keep that I don't want to change? I want to keep. I'm not creating something new. I'm preserving. I'm maintaining. I'm protecting what I have. And that could be something like positive relationships with people. It could be something related to where you live. It could be your history, your tradition. What is it in life you want to keep? The third dimension is called accepting. Negative, keep. I'm not crazy about it. I'm probably not going to change it. In my life, where am I spending my time on things that I don't necessarily like them? I'm not going to change them. What is it in your life you need to just learn to accept? And then finally, that would be change negative, eliminating. What is it in life you need to get rid of? My book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, was a popular book. One reason, it talked about what to stop doing in life, what to eliminate, not just what to start doing or what to create. So if you look at a simple model, as you wander through life, ask yourself four basic questions. Who is the new me that I want to create? What is it about myself that I want to preserve? What is it I need to learn to accept? Finally, what is it I need to eliminate? When you coach others, you can use this model. I've done this in team building. Ask the team. Describe the perfect team for the future. What are you going to need to create? What do you want to keep about your team? What do you need to just accept about each other? And what do you need to eliminate? Or even your organization. My friend Vijay Gundarajan deals with this a lot. He challenges people in their organizations to look at what is it you want to create. He also says, what do you need to get rid of? What do you need to accept? And what is it you want to preserve or maintain? I think you'll find this model to be a practical model in going through life at the individual level, at the team level, and at the organizational level. I'm now going to teach you a new term. This term, if you deeply internalize what I'm going to tell you, is going to help you be a more effective professional, and more important, it's going to help you have a lot happier life. What is this term? IWAT. Now, IWAT is just an acronym for some initials, and, and it represents one of the most important sayings that we need to repeat over and over, like a mantra as we travel through life. What is this mantra? Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? Before you deal with anything, breathe. Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? The great Peter Drucker taught me a wonderful lesson. Our mission in life is not to prove we're smart. Our mission in life is not to prove we're right. Our mission in life is to make a positive difference. We get so lost in proving that we're smart and proving that we're right, we forget to make a positive difference. You're at the party. Some person is talking about politics and you don't like it. You get in some stupid political discussion over nothing. Nobody wants to hear it. You're not going to make a difference in this topic anyway. How many millions of hours do we spend complaining about the weather? Did the weather god ever call you and say, how do you feel about the weather? Do you want me to change it for you? I don't think so. Here's the key. 
life is short. None of us have too much time. As I get older, this becomes more clear. We don't have that much time. You really need to focus on how can I make the best use of the time that I have? And as Peter Drucker said, how can I make a positive difference? Before you deal with any topic, breathe. Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? If the answer is yes, go for it. And no one can answer that question for you but you. If the answer is no, take a deep breath. Let it go. Let it go. we do what we know we want to do? Well, you know, if I ask you to give me a profile of you you want to create in the future, my guess you'd give me a wonderful list of adjectives. You'd describe a person who's in shape, who's a nice person, good with our family, happy, gets things done, productive, rich. Why don't we become this person? Well, if you look at the statistics, at least in the Western world, um, depression is kind of an all-time high. Employee engagement is near an all-time low. Many people are bitter, uh, disaffected, alienated, obese, depressed. Why don't we become the person that we want to be? Why don't we do what we know we should be doing? Well, I'm going to make a little prediction. I'm the only teacher you've ever met that's collected input from tens of thousands of people who have been to my classes, and I measure, do they do what I say, and do they get better? Well, you know what? I've got good news. The people that do the stuff, they get better. i got even better news. People that do nothing, well, they don't get worse. Years ago, my biggest client was Johnson & Johnson, a wonderful company. I had the privilege of working with their top 2,000 leaders. I helped them develop their Johnson & Johnson standards of leadership. Every leader that went to our program got feedback, and I asked them all to, to pick something important to work on, to talk to people, to follow up, and we'll measure, did they do it and did they get better? Well, at the end of my class, about 98% of the people said, I'm going to do what Marshall just told me, about 98%. A year later, about 70% had done something, and 30% had done absolutely zero. Not one minute. Now, I'm not ashamed of these numbers. I'm proud of these numbers. 70% of 2,000 people is 1,400 people getting evaluated by 10 coworkers each. 14,000 people have a little bit better life. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm proud of that. And I got to interview the people that, that didn't do anything. I said, why'd you do nothing? Their answer had nothing to do with ethics, values, integrity. A Johnson & Johnson was rated as the most ethical company in the world that year. They are good people. You're good people. Answer had nothing to do with intelligence. They're smart people. You're smart people. The reason people did nothing had to do with a dream. Yes, this is a dream I've had for years, and I'm going to make a prediction. You may have had the same dream. Yes, you may have had this same dream on a recurring basis for years, and this dream is going to describe why in life we all don't do what we know we should. Now, what's that dream sound like? It sounds like this. You know, I'm incredibly busy right now. Given pressures of work and home and new technology that follows me everywhere and emails and voicemails and global competition, I feel about as busy as I ever have. Sometimes I feel overcommitted. I don't tell others this, but every now and again, my life feels just a little bit out of control. But you know, I'm working on some very unique and special challenges right now. And I think the worst of this is going to be over in about four or five months. And after that, I'm going to take two or three weeks and get organized and spend some time with the family and I'm going to begin my new healthy life program and after that everything is going to be different and it will not be crazy anymore. Have you ever had a dream that vaguely resembles this dream? How many years you've been having this dream? Well I've learned something. There's not going to be any two or three weeks. Sanity is not going to kick in. Well, there's an outside chance tomorrow is going to be even crazier than today. Let's imagine you're in a job where you've got to make those numbers every quarter. You've got to make those numbers. Let's imagine you scored 20% above every target this year. 20% above all targets. Well, what are the odds a big boss is going to come back next year and say, take a little break while you're working too hard? 
Let's lower those goals for next year. Is that going to be happening? No. What's going to happen the next goal? Those goals are going up and up and up. Well, it is always going to be crazy out there and we're always going to be under pressure. The first reason we don't do what we plan to do is we have some dream that tomorrow is going to be different than today. Uh, the second reason we don't do what we need to do is called the planner bias. The planner bias. Now, what does that mean? The person that's doing the planning is not the same as the person that's doing the executing. See, that person making plans for your life is typically not sleepy and they're sitting in a room and they're not working and they're planning for all these doers to do these good things. Well, they're planning for that doer, don't eat too much and, and, and don't drink too much and, and you go work out. They're making all these good plans for the doer. They're not doing the work, they're making the plans. Well, the person doing the work is not the same as that person making a plan. The person doing the work may be tired, hungry, bored. There's a term called depleted. The person doing that work is just out of gas. Well, the planner doesn't count on that because the planner is not the person doing the work. The person planning the work is very, very different than that person doing the work. That's called the planner bias. One of the reasons we don't do what we know we should do. A couple of other reasons. One. It takes longer than we think. We almost always underestimate how much time it takes to get anything done. Two, it's harder than we think. We almost always underestimate the degree of differences. And then finally, this is what I call the high probability of low probability events. When we make plans for our future, we never plan on a low probability event occurring. You don't plan on having a car wreck or you don't plan on somebody dying, or you don't plan on somebody getting sick. Why, these are low probability events. You think, well, it's very unlikely any of those events would occur. And if they do, you think, well, what are the odds that would have happened? Although the odds on any one low probability event occurring are slim, the odds on some low probability event occurring are incredibly high. Why? There are a million things that could happen. When I coach people, I typically coach them for a year and a half, and I tell them one thing. I can't tell you what crisis you're going to have. I can guarantee you will have a crisis. I've never coached anyone for 18 months that didn't have a crisis. And I don't mean a fake crisis, I mean a real one. Somebody died, somebody got sick, the company got bought, the company got sold. Something always happens. So, in summary, when you're making those plans, realize a few things. One, tomorrow's probably going to be just as crazy as today. And when you make that plan, don't assume that tomorrow is going to be this different world where everything's going to be easier than today. And number two, realize that you that's making the plan is not the same as you that's executing the plan. And realize those people doing the work, they're not living in the same world you're living in right now. It's going to be harder than you think. It's going to take more time than you think. And then finally realize that no matter how much you want to think about the advance and how much, how much you think we can control the future, there's always a high probability that some low probability event is going to occur. One of the great works in literature, one of the great works in philosophy, one of the most influential poems ever written, the Bhagavad Gita. The Gita. The Gita makes some wonderful points that we can use as we journey through life to help ourselves today. One of the great points from the Gita is simple to understand yet hard to really implement. What is it? Do not become attached to the fruits of your labor. Do not become attached to the fruits of your labor. This is a very non-Western concept because we're so focused on winning and achievement and being proud of what we've done that we get lost. If you look at the wisdom of this, the great Western disease is I'll be happy when, when I get the money status, BMW condominium. Well, as you grow older, you learn, not really. Happiness is not gonna come from some achievement or some car or some money. Don't become attached to the fruits of your labor because happiness is a process in life, it's not a result. Ironically, this actually helps us achieve more in life rather than less. Let's take a golfer. You hit a golf drive. It's a beautiful drive. It's going right down the middle. Someone has left a can in the middle of the fairway. 
randomly, your drive hits the can and bounces into a sand trap. If you're not careful, what happens? You become angry, livid. You go to the sand trap, you swing too hard, you knock the ball across the green, you throw your club into a lake. You ruin the day for everybody. Why? You let that one shot, the results of that, ruin your day. As opposed to a great learning point for golf that comes from the Gita is this. You play the shots that's in front of you. You hit a bad shot, what do you do? You let it go. Because if you think about the previous shot, the fruits of that labor, you're going to ruin yourself for the future shot. Now, a couple of the great Western coaches in college history totally understand this point. One of them, although I didn't think he defined himself as a Buddhist, had a very Buddhist philosophy. It was John Wooden, the coach at UCLA. I have a PhD at UCLA, and I was there when the great coach was there. And John Wooden never focused on winning. Do you know what he said? In life, what's important is that we do our best. If we do our best and win, we should be happy. If we don't do our best and win, we have nothing to be proud of. And by the way, if we do our best and lose, we shouldn't be ashamed. Why we did our best? He said, in life, all I want you to do is just do your best. That's a key point from the Gita. Do your duty, do your best. Another great coach is probably one of the top coaches in football in the United States today, Nick Saban, coach of Alabama, wins the national championship. Rather than reveling in the victory, what is the first thing he said? Oh, the biggest problem I have with winning this championship is I've got to go to a bunch of dinners and a bunch of distractions. What I really want to do is go back to work and focus on next year. And let's get back to work and practice and do what's right and learn. Well, both of these great coaches learned something from the Gita. In life, do your best. Golfing analogy, you hit that shot. It's in front of you. Play the shot that's in front of you. Whatever you did in the past, take a deep breath and let it go. You can't change the past. You can't change the results of the past. All you can do in life is do your best and focus on the future. Another learning from the Bhagavad Gita. What can we learn from the Gita? Well, in the Gita, you have Prince Arjuna getting ready to face a terrible battle. He has to make a hard choice. And his choices are all bad. He's either going to take one road, which is a tough road he's not real happy with. He's got to take another road, which is probably even worse. He's distraught. His charioteer's manifestation of Krishna gives him advice. In Western terms, what is the one simple piece of advice I'd like to share with you now from the Gita? Make peace with what is. Make peace with what is. We are where we are. We may not be where we wish we were. We may not be where we want to be. We are where we are. The secret of having a great life is make peace with what is. We go through life carrying around anger. We carry around bad feelings. We don't forgive people. Why? We're living in the past. Very important learning point from the Gita is live in the present. Focus on where you are. Think of those people that maybe bothered you in life. Forgive them. Let it go. Think of that annoyance you had with the person down the street. Think of that person that cut in front of you in the traffic. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Very important as we journey through life to say, here I am, I'm here right now, here's what's in front of me, how can I do my best to make the best of the situation I'm in, as opposed to where a lot of our lives are wasted, ruminating on the past and ruminating on what we cannot control.